Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr. We're coming to you from the Old Capitol Museum on the central campus at the University of Iowa, and glad to have you all with us today for a program on the language of the brain. Scientific and medical advances of recent decades have led to previously unimaginable revelations about the human body's innermost secrets, and some of the richest areas of study, as you might imagine, are in the brain. In this four-part series, we'll be learning about research into neurological disorders and some of the recent advances that are making real differences in people's lives. We'll talk about the aging mind and brain, what changes we should expect as a part of normal aging, and what sorts of diminishments in brain capacity may be stalled or prevented as we age, and we'll venture into the fascinating field of artificial intelligence. But we open the series with a discussion about brain development, and I'm very happy to have these two guests with us this afternoon. Just to my left is Joshua Weiner from the UI Department of Biology. Thanks for coming this afternoon, Josh. Thank you, Brian. And Mark Bloomberg is, uh, is our other guest, and he's from the UI Department of Psychology. So thank you for being here. Thank you. So Josh, I'd like to start with you. Um, as the starting point for everything else in this program, I'd like to learn a little bit about normal brain development. Where do we begin? Well, we begin very early in the embryo. So actually, once the egg is fertilized within, I think in humans, I don't study humans as we mentioned, but <laughs> in humans, it's about three to four weeks. You already have the neural tube, which is the embryonic structure that will give rise to the brain and the spinal cord, and that's already formed. So very early, by the end of the first month, you already have a nervous system. And by the end of the first trimester, you already have a brain that resembles a human brain in that it has a very large cerebral cortex, the front part of the brain, which is particularly large in humans. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some studies that suggest there's already electrical activity occurring in the brain at that point, and that's generally how the brain works, is through electrical activity between brain cells. Mm -hmm. what, what is the brain made of? <laughs> That's good. The brain is made of cells, like everything else in the body. Um, this was established in the uh, middle 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, for a long time, it's interesting, there's, there was a debate about whether the brain was made up of cells as the rest of the body is. And that's because brain cells, which are called neurons, have a very unique shape, or very many unique shapes. They have a, a sort of cell body region, which looks like other cells, which are kind of round or square. But then it has these very long stretches that go out from one side and out from the other side. And these are uh, sort of like wires or cables through which neurons communicate with each other. And that's really what makes the brain unique, is that these cells form contacts with each other. They talk to each other through these contacts. And other cells in the body don't really do that to the same extent. They tend to release hormones into the bloodstream, which go everywhere. But the nervous system has a point-to-point -point wiring that allows it to actually transmit information in a, a more interesting way, I think, than many other tissues in the body. Mm. Um, so the brain is made up of, the, of these cells. And these cells are born in the brain. And there's a couple of interesting things about how the brain develops. Uh, that, that might not be immediately obvious. And one is that um, nearly half of all the cells that are born in the brain during development actually will die. So the brain, our brains at least, mammalian brains, mm -hmm. there are organisms with simpler brains that don't do this as much, but mammalian brains actually make twice as many neurons as they will need. And then as these neurons make connections with each other, the ones that don't make the right connections or don't get a connection or in other ways are unhappy or unhealthy are eliminated. And so this is sort of a theme, I think, in, in not only the early development of the brain in terms of the number of cells, but the number of connections, that you actually make more cells, you make more connections than you need, and you winnow these away as the brain develops and as the brain essentially learns what the correct connections are and pathways are uh, during development. And is this winnowing away different in every single individual? Yes, this would be different in every individual, mm -hmm. Mark would agree. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of the mechanisms that control it are similar. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, this is different in, in all individuals. And this is something that you know, we, we think about learning and developing as primarily forming connections. So these connections are called synapses, where neurons contact each other. So just colloquially, you all think about learning new things, forming new synapses. You even hear people say that. But, uh, and that, of course, does occur. But a large part of maturation and learning is actually the removal of excess synapses. Hmm. So if you look at the density of connections in an infant, it's actually higher than it is in a 10-year-old. Hmm. So during that process, with what that 
child is actually doing, or the developing animal, is actually removing some of the connections that it doesn't need so mm -hmm. that the existing ones, presumably, so the existing ones, uh, can function um, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, not just, it's not just building up the brain, there's also this pattern of loss in the brain. Mm -hmm. And this pattern of, of pruning away, it's actually called pruning, pruning away these connections, uh, is believed to be disturbed in some neurodevelopmental disorders, and this may be one reason why these disorders occur. Mm -hmm. Although I think it's fair to say we don't really understand how that works. Mm -hmm. But yeah, elaborate on that a little bit. Some mm -hmm. developmental disorders that, that may, if you think of one that, that is in a, a new, newborn child has some sort of developmental problem. Well, I think one that you, know, you hear a lot about is uh, autism mm -hmm. recently, because there's a lot of uh, indication that the rates of autism may be going up. Um, it's actually, I think, unclear how much of that is due to increased diagnosis. There are a lot of children being diagnosed as, as autistic or autism spectrum disorder that previously would have been given some other diagnosis or, in fact, even ignored. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we can talk about that a little bit. And um, you know, it's very difficult to know what actually causes such a disorder because for obvious reasons, we don't really get to look inside of autistic children's brains. These children, autism is not a lethal disease. These children still uh, grow up otherwise normally, uh, physically normally in many cases. And so you can't get the tissue to look at it. Um, and so we have to model, we can model these diseases in animals. Mm -hmm. So um, we can use mice as the common organism. And you may not think that mice are very similar to humans, but in fact, they actually have all of the same brain regions. So all of the mammals um, have very similar looking brains to, mm -hmm. to a first approximation. Um, and so you um, can uh, look at models of autism in mice. There are mice that have mutations in genes that cause them to exhibit behaviors that are somewhat similar, if you squint, to, uh, to human autism. And so we can study it that way. In the few cases where um, we've looked at autistic brains, or scientists have looked at autistic brains, it's the case where an autistic child has an accident or dies in some other way and the brain is donated. Um, what you actually see is not a reduction in the density of connections, but actually too many connections. Mm. Uh, the synapses form pr primarily on these structures called dendritic spines, and these spines are actually more prevalent in the brains that have been examined. There's also a recent study showing that there's some disorganization of um, the arrangement of cells, of neurons, in the cerebral cortex of autistic children. So something goes wrong with the way the neurons connect with each other and perhaps the way they prune connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so this may be a problem. If, if, if an autistic child has, has too many connections, you know, you can sort of guess that it's difficult perhaps for them to kind of focus on mm -hmm. external sensory information that's coming in. There's maybe a lot of noise going on internally in these, uh, in these uh, networks, and so that may be one reason. Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, I, I think it's really too early to say that we have any firm understanding of how that works. Sure, sure. Well, let me turn to you, Mark uh, mm -hmm. Bloomberg. So we've been talking to a biologist about brain development. Mm -hmm. How is the conversation different when we talk to a psychologist? Well, on the, on the basics, not too much. So there's, there's a remarkable degree of overlap between a psychologist like myself and a biologist like Josh. So um, you know, in psychology, we tend to focus more on the behavioral side of things. But when, for those of us like myself, we're neuroscientists, and we're interested in understanding the brain, many of the, the, there's just a high degree of overlap of the sorts of things that we'd be doing. You know, in fact, we collaborate because we have so much overlap. And so if you're interested in brain de development, you're interested in behavioral development, you basically have to explore all the various things that are going on that can be contributing to the either the diversity of, of, of you know within individuals across and within a species or the diversity of cross, across species. We're all basically asking the same the same types of questions. My focus is more, uh, whereas um, you know I, there are psychologists who study embryology, right? But I most of, I, most of my work is done in a postnatal uh, environment with uh, with rats and mice mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. So I don't study humans very much. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, but there, you could make extrapolations from what you what you see in the research you're doing with the yeah, pets. Yeah, the humans are sort of interesting too. So I do I do try to, uh, but you know, for understanding basic mechanisms and really get, being able to get experimental control over the sorts of things we want to do, we can't do that in humans very well, especially with the types of questions that we right. try to answer. Well, you mentioned um, diversity a, a, a moment ago um, in what might be considered normal. I'm wondering what kind of latitude there is in in what we would consider normal. A, a normal population uh, group, a, if we think of normal brain function, how much variation can there be from person to person well, before you fall out of that? Remarkable <laughs> variation. If you just look around yeah, the room, yeah. there's remarkable yeah. variation. Yeah, yeah. Everybody looks alike and everybody yeah. is, is very different. And this has a lot to do with, with what Josh was talking about with respect to what not only in our bodies but in our brains as well. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of variety in terms of how these various neurons hook up with one another. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a incredible amount of lack of variety. I mean, the mm -hmm. same basic parts of the brain connect to the same basic parts of the brain. It's true in humans, it's true in mice, it's true in rats. In fact, if you look at a rat brain and you look at a human brain, all the same parts are connecting to all of the other same parts, right? So there's a tremendous amount of cross-species um, a lack of variability or orderliness in the way that these structures are, are wired up. At the same time, we all have very, very different experiences in terms of within the embryo, we have different experiences. As we're born, we have different experiences. And these molecular experiences and broader social experiences have tremendous uh, impact on who we are. Yeah. Um, that said, you know, there's another side of this. So people tend to focus on two different aspects of, of this issue of uh, what's called robustness versus variability. The robust side is, uh, we, yeah, we're different, but we're so alike, right? There's just so much within, you know, across species, you know, dogs tend to bark and we tend to talk, or, uh, you know, we walk on two legs and dogs walk on four legs, so and all of them do, right? But there's also a tremendous amount of plasticity. So the other side of robustness is this idea that, that we have a lot of plasticity, especially when we're young, um, when, when, we, when we need it a little bit more, when we are trying to figure out how our bodies work. And that plasticity is critical um, and can be extreme. And so, for example, there are dogs, there have been many animals that have been born without, you know, with legs, uh, maybe just born with hind legs. There's an incredible boxer that, uh, that you might have seen on YouTube. It made its way around Facebook. Uh, it was a boxer born without hind legs. I'd never seen this before. And it was running on its four legs without any hind legs. And it looks like a dog from the you look at the face, but the whole body has been remodeled so that the animal can walk on its four legs. And you look at animals that lack four legs and they're standing upright. And there was a famous dog in Oklahoma City called Faith. She's still around. And she walked. She grew into her deformity, right? She, she had a curved spine. She shifted her body weight. And she walks beautifully upright on her two hind legs. Mm -hmm. And so she accomplished in one lifetime one of what is supposed to be one of the great accomplishments of human evolution. Right? In a lifetime. So that's an incredible amount of plasticity that needs to be explained as well. So we have these two competing issues. Some people focus on the robustness and they say, oh, everything's innate. And other people focus on the other side and say that there's nothing that's innate. But of course, you know, the, believing this idea issue of what it means for something to be innate, mm -hmm. there, is, there are these two aspects to biology and behavior that have to be explained. And that's what we try to understand in our work. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually, I mean, I was just talking to a colleague who's a pediatric neurologist the other day. Um, and um, he was presenting this, this case of a family where there was a, a gene mutation that they had cloned. And it um, turns out that many members of this family that are affected have a large part of their brain missing. They, they can see this when they do MRI scans or CT scans. And these people are completely normal. So the children are honor students and completely high functioning. One of the uncles was an engineer. And so this is the same kind of thing also during embryogenesis. You can have a defect in the brain, a large part of it missing. But if the, if the fetus and then the baby grows up with this part missing, they're able to rewire around the, the defect, and they can actually function completely normal. It's a huge amount of plasticity. And you know, similar things happen with uh, hydrocephalics, you know, what used to be called water on the brain, where you have tremendous growth of these, the, the, what are called the ventricles, which contain this fluid that is critical for the functioning of our brain. But if there's too much fluid, it compresses the brain from inside the skull, and the cerebral cortex can become exceedingly thin. Normally it is of one thickness, but in, these, in, in, in people who have hydrocephaly, it can be extremely thin, and yet you would, there's, there's no obvious 
you know, um, problem with them in terms of behavior and intelligence or anything else that they do. So again, you know, there is this incredible amount of uh, reserve of plasticity that we have that we can deal with as mm -hmm. we, uh, and, it's, and it's true throughout life to a large extent as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so then, um, uh, in those cases where uh, an adaptation or the necessary plasticity hasn't provided the kind of accommodation a person would need in order to function well, so there's a developmental disorder, there's, there's something that's not working right in the brain. Um, what, uh, what are you researching to, uh, is it a molecular level intervention, a genetic level um, adjustment that one would hope to make in order to encourage <laughs> <Right>. improvement there? <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's difficult uh, to say because um, one, you know, one difficulty of the brain is it is encased in the skull. Yeah. This is a good thing for most of us because uh, we bump our heads from time to time. Um, but you can't get in there, okay? You can't, it's very difficult to get in there to make any manipulation. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem also with drugs and chemicals, which are that many of them don't make it into the brain because there's something called the blood-brain barrier. And this is a huge problem for finding new drugs, actually. They often will find drugs by putting them on neurons in a dish, and they work just fine. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you can't get them into the brain mm -hmm. because there are mechanisms to keep bad stuff out. Um, it's, it's difficult to say. I think in some cases, if, you, if there are disorders, and there are disorders where there are single genes that are associated with that disorder, there is a mutation in that gene that can cause that disorder. Uh, an example is, is one called Rett syndrome, which is uh, R-E-T-T, -T, which is often referred to as a female autism. So autism is four times more prevalent in, in males than in, in, than in females. There's a version with autistic features called Rett syndrome. This is caused by a mutation in a single gene. We know what the gene is. And in a mouse model of that disorder where they've removed the gene and then later in development put it back, you actually get a rescue of some of the behavioral mm -hmm. phenotypes, the behavioral um, aspects. So it's possible. It is possible. We don't know how to do that right now safely mm -hmm. in humans. And again, neither of us are doctors, so we can't really speak mm -hmm. about the clinical <laughs> aspect of this. Um, but you know, pr presumably that is something that could be done. Um, it's, um, but I, there's also you know, a lot of um, effective behavioral interventions. Mm -hmm. I know in autism and other disorders, you can have huge uh, improvements due to behavioral interventions. Yeah. I, so this is so Josh. I sort of represent these two different ways of coming at a problem, and so very often, you know, the, the caricature would be that if uh, we, we were faced with a problem, he's going to look first at the genetics, and I'm going to look first at, at sort of the system as a whole. And um, it's sort of just the way we're trained and the way we think about the world. So whenever I, I always try to temper the tendency to go straight to genetics by reminding people that. Uh, um, that there's, you know, we often think about the difference, for example, between males and females. You know, it's 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 innate because it's innate; it must be genetic or something like that. Would be a very simplified argument. But it's very important to remember that crocodiles and turtles and all sorts of other animals like them, um, they're clear males and females. They they have sex like males and females are supposed to. They give birth. The females give birth to, and yet there are no genetic differences between the males and the females. The differences between them are completely determined by the temperature of the eggs when they are being incubated. So there are no genetic differences at all. It's evolutionarily important. The, th the important thing is that the system is the same in, these, in, a, in a turtle as it is in us when it comes to making males and females, mm -hmm. except for what triggers the cascade that leads to males and females. It could be chromosomal in us, XX if you're a female, XY if you're a male. And in those animals, there are no chromosomal differences. It's just hot, warm temperatures or cold temperatures. And I, so the, the way to think about it is that very often genetic and environmental influences on a developing system can be interchangeable. You can use a genetic mechanism. Sometimes you can use a non-genetic mechanism. But either one, as long as you, as long as you get it Done, it really doesn't matter how you get it done, as long as it's as long as it's something that can be reliably transduced across generations. And temperatures always vary in beaches where turtle eggs are laid, and so there's no problem uh, with with making that happen. We'll see what happens with global warming and turtles, mm -hmm. but that's another story. But, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to note um, that uh, we were talking about this before. <laughs> we were joking about this. That, you know, whenever you see something set up in science or maybe anything where it's, it's either this or this, and there are these warring camps that are always fighting about, like nature, nurture, right? So I mean, nature would be genes, nurture is environment. A lot of people disagree about how important those things are. The answer is always both, okay, always. I mean, th there's a debate for 10 years, and then oops, the answer is both. And yet, every time we still get mad at each other, <laughs> um, I, Mark and I do at least. Um, and, uh, 
you know, and, and so it's the same case here. And, and, the, and I want to point out that the disorder I referred to before, Rett syndrome, where there is a particular gene, that is the, the rarity. The vast majority of things that you would want to change about the cognitive abilities of a person, all of the things that, that, that annoy my wife, for example, are, are not likely to be changed by a single gene. These are very, very complicated things, and there's really no way to fix them in that kind of sense. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think um, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue, and you don't, you don't want, I wouldn't want people to think that um, their, you know, genetic component is all there is mm -hmm. to um, the kind of person they're going to be, because it isn't true. And mm -hmm. um, even though things like IQ have a fairly high heritability quo uh, quotient, which means that a lot of the variability in IQ could be ascribed to genetics, mm -hmm. so does vocabulary size. And yet, we don't know any words in the womb, right? So we only <laughs> learn words later. So clearly, what, what you're inheriting is some sort of propensity or um, proclivity towards certain abilities, but it doesn't mean that people who don't inherit that, whatever it is, we don't know what it is, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if you don't study your vocabulary and work on it, you can't have an amazing vocabulary that's much greater than someone with that, yeah. that came from that family. So it just, you know, it, it's real, always both, I think. Mm -hmm. Is there some particularly tantalizing thing each of you are working on in your own individual research that, that you're, you think will lead you to some new understanding of this brain development? Is there, is there something you're focusing on now that... Yeah, uh, sure. Of course. All of, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Everything we do is great. Well, so what I, what I, what I, what I study is uh, I study the sleep development. I'm interested in sleep. I'm interested in how sleep contributes to, our, to the development of our, of our ability to, just to take a very crude example, you can close your eyes and you can move your fingers and you can feel your fingers moving, right? You have very clear maps in your brain of all these different parts of your body. Where do they come from? And so what I study is a very strange behavior that animals make. You've probably seen them. Uh, if you have babies or dogs or cats when they're sleeping and these twitches that they make when they're, when they're in what's called REM sleep. And the, and the, the old tale you know, about it is that you know, if you see a dog twitching in its sleep, it's chasing, chasing rabbits. Well, that we, we're pretty sure that that's not true. We're not, they're not chasing rabbits. The, the thing is that there's a part of your brain that's completely independent of where you dream that's producing these movements. And what we think is that these movements, which in rat pups and also in humans, occur hundreds of thousands of times every day. And that it's, it's a lot. We just don't pay a lot of attention to it. What you're doing or what we're doing when we're, when we're twitching is we're exploring our limbs. That's what makes Faith the dog able to learn how to walk on two legs. She explored the body she had. And so what you do is you, you twitch and you send out a signal to that muscle and you receive information about that muscle, okay, or that movement, and you map your brain. You update your, your brain relationship. And through this process of twitching and moving, you explore the body that you have been born with. Right? And so through that way, you sort of bootstrap your nervous system. And it also helps you, of course, when you get older and grow. As you grow, your limbs are getting bigger. You get more muscle. You gain more fat. You lose some fat. You lose a limb. All of these things change, and you have to be able to adapt to this. You need to calibrate your system throughout your entire life. And that's what we think sleep is important for. So we're in the process now of taking this, where we've done this basic work in developing rats and mice, and now we're exporting it into humans, and humans also across the lifespan, to see what role that these things are. Uh, what these movements play in, in, wow. in keeping the, the whole system working. Yeah, properly. yeah, fascinating. And can we get a little peek into what you're working on? Yeah, so um, what my lab studies is actually uh, how neurons form connections during development. Um, a lot of this is happening in the fetus or in the young uh, baby. And we do this in mice as a model for, for humans. And so we know that neurons contact each other using special molecules that are sticky, and they, uh, these sticky molecules bind only to other sticky molecules. They're kind of like a specific kind of Velcro. One time, type of Velcro will only bind another. And so we're studying a large family of these and trying to understand how the diversity of this family, and we know that this family can create uh, 20 to 30,000 kinds of Velcro. Is that enough to specify certain cells forming connections with each other, and does that go uh, wrong in certain disorders? And so the class of molecules we study actually have been implicated in autism and some other disorders, and so we don't have a good basic understanding of how they work, mm -hmm. and so that's what we're trying to, to do in our lab. Wow, wow.
I'm so grateful you would both come here this afternoon to, to share this with us. And um, for all of you listening, um, this is the first segment of a four-part series on the language of the brain. And our guests this afternoon in this segment have been uh, Josh Weiner, just next to me here, and Mark Bloomberg. So thank you. And I hope you'll join us next time for a discussion of neurological disorders, particularly epilepsy and stroke, and some of the advancements in treatments that are making real differences in people's lives. Uh, all World Canvas programming is available on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. I'm Joan Kerr, and for International Programs, thank you very much for listening.